Heavenly Father, I come before you now in the name of your Son, Jesus. Lord, we pour out to you because there's so many hurting people, so many people that's being stressed and pulled and so many people have become discouraged and ready to quit and give up. Father, we lift the brokenhearted to you right now in the name of your son, Jesus. We ask you to touch each and every person, God, who comes into our conference tonight. We pray a special blessing over their lives. And Lord, I ask you that you would just touch me now that The word that I give will come through in the manner that you desire. Touch me that I will be able to to deliver the message, God, with clarity, understanding, and with power. Father, I pray for the sick and afflicted. I lift my brother Sean Wesley, the, the police officer who fell and hit his head and is presently, presently, Uh, having surgery and is now recovering. He's still in the surgical ICU, God, but you see him. So, God, we pray for him now that he would have complete, complete recovery, that his healing would be manifested, that not only that, but he would have a testimony of how good you are Bless his family, God, his wife, his family, who tried to be encouraged, who tried to keep the faith. Bless them, God, only they know and you know the things that they suffer and go through. God, remember the sick and afflicted that have been part of Gospel Truth's family. God, we lift the prayer list before you right now. The prayer list that Minister Ida has assembled and the different ones that called in, God, we, we, we lift it before you, that you would move upon it, and not just move upon it, but let them know that you are near, that all they have to do is just put their faith in you and they trust in you, and you will answer. God, I'm thankful for all the people you have brought into my life, Although, whether it's the friend or foe, I pray that the foes be turned around and become friends. God, I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful for this avenue, this prayer line, conference call line, Christian education line that we utilizing. I'm grateful to you for that. And, Father, I'm thankful that you will continue to be with us and continue to touch us and continue to be part of us as we go forward. Those that are in need of your touch, God, we pray that you would touch them. Those who are in need of strength, we pray that you would strengthen them. Those who are in need of financial uh, accountability or relational problems, God, those that are suffering in their families and going through ups and downs in their life right now. God, we just pray that you will move upon them. Somebody's home is being ripped apart. The father has given up and don't want to go any further, God, but you need to strengthen him. Touch him right now. Turn him around. Send him back home, God. That mother who's trying her best to raise her children, but yet seeing fruitless in her eyes. God, encourage her, direct her, and help her to see that she's not alone. God, we're thankful for this government that we have. We're thankful for it. Is there a problem? Yes, there's a problem. You know about it. Is there things we would like to see change? Yes, there's things we would like to see change. You know about it. But God, we just pray. In the name of your son, Jesus, that you will move and make a difference in their lives. Turn the government around, God. Don't even let them make decisions that would be in conflict with your word. 
God, help them to see clearly the needs of the people. Take position out of it. And God, we'll be grateful to you for all that you do, for all that you are, in the name of Jesus. And I'm thankful for uh, the way this life is going, the way our world is going. I'm thankful because it shows signs that your return is very soon. We're thankful, God, that we're on the side of righteousness. Uh, Being on the side of righteousness opens up the door to many blessings. We're grateful that you are our God. We're grateful that we can go forward and not look back, that we can press towards the mark. We're grateful, God. We're grateful for your Holy Spirit that would guide and comfort us and teach us and bring all things back to our remembrance that you have said. We're grateful to that. God, we're grateful for everything that has come into, everyone that has come into our lives, that you have purpose and plan. And we pray that you will allow us the wisdom to know how to speak a word in season to all those who come in. God, don't let us be a detriment. Don't let us be the instrument that turn people away from you. But help us to be able to draw people closer and closer. The relationship that you have with your people is more important than any relationship we can ever establish. So, God, we pray that that relationship between my spiritual brother and sister is sound. If we have crossed anyone, if we have caused difficulties in anyone's lives, God, we we ask your forgiveness and direct us so that we can go to the one who we have harmed bring peace and understanding and wisdom into their life. We're thankful, God. I don't know what the word that you have given me tonight. I don't know who it is designed for. And to be honest, God, it's not even my purpose to know. I don't care to know. All I want to do is your will. I'm going to speak it. I'll preach it. I'll teach it. You give it to me. I'll direct it. And, Father, thank you again for all that comes into this conference. We're thankful for the prayer lines. We're thankful for our church, our home church in Detroit, Gospel Truth Tabernacle of God. We're thankful for it. We pray a special blessing that all those who walk through the door will be blessed. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, and we all say, Amen. 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 Hello, everyone. I give honor to my Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ, and declare that his name is the only name whereby men shall be saved. I'm Donald L. Kirkwood, the senior pastor of Gospel Truth Tabernacle of God Church in the beautiful city of Detroit, Michigan. I welcome you to another episode of From the Pastor's Desk. I will grant time for questions and comments at the end of our lesson. If you wish to comment at that time, just press the number 5 and the the star key on your telephone keypad, which will indicate to me that your hand is being raised. At the appropriate time, I will then give you the opportunity to present your comments. And let me say right here, the recording of tonight's lesson will become available 10 minutes after we go off the air. Just go to our church website at gttdetroit.org and click on the media tab. There you will find the call-in numbers and the access numbers for all the lessons we have presented. And let me say this, if you ever... Uh, forget where the website is. The name of the church is Gospel Truth Tabernacle. Just Google it. It'll take you right to our website, and then you can find the access number and the dial-in number for the recordings. Today's lesson, <clears throat> praise God, I want to get into dying to self and living to serve. Dying to self and living to serve is going to be based on the book of Ephesians, the second chapter of Ephesians, 
verses 1 through 6, the second chapter of Ephesians, verses 1 through 6, dying to self, living to serve. This evening, we're going to deal with the subject dying to self, living to serve, and I thank God for this word on today because I know without a shadow of a doubt this word is being delivered as we transition into the year 2018. We're three months into it, but yet God is still transitioning us. It's as if God is releasing the word to stand as a bridge to link us from where we are and where we're going. See, only God knows where we're going. So since he knows where we're going, he knows what we need. And I believe God wants us to enter into this new season in our lives, understanding the foundational principles of Christian living and Christian service, and that being selflessness, mainly dying to self. Tonight there's going to be a funeral. Self must die. But but although this is a funeral, funeral, we had no reason to mourn because there's also going to be a resurrection. We're going to live to serve. It's John 3.16 that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 seems to define God's relationship between him and us. And that relationship is based upon extreme selflessness. God gave his only son. His son gave his life. He then ascended and gave us the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit gives and quickens those gifts that God has placed in us. And what we find is there's a constant deposit into our lives from heaven, mainly because our fleshly walk on earth is in opposition with what God would like for us. Even though things we celebrate, even those things we celebrate, and I want you to think about holidays and birthdays and and all the things we celebrate, Those things have become breeding grounds for latter-day spiritual wickedness and spiritual weakness. One of the greatest and most popular holidays celebrated in our society is Christmas. And the Christmas season is about selflessness. It's about giving. But the greatest struggle of the Christmas season, particularly with children, is that of getting, I want, I want, I want. And that spirit, the I want spirit, is the antithesis of, or the opposite of the spirit of that season. See, it's not about getting, it's about giving. Praise God. And I believe with all my heart that what we have done, and in some cases still doing, is raising a generation of takers. The Bible declares in Proverbs 22, 6, to train up the child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he should not depart from it. That's Proverbs 22 and 6, where our training has been very, very poor because we've been training our children to be takers and not givers. So we have to really deal with our children, particularly at Christmas. And I know you probably said, well, Pastor, why are you talking about Christmas in March? Because it's really not just about Christmas. It's about the whole year. But at Christmas, we need to particularly deal with our children by telling them this is not about you. We pray that you understand, but this is not about you receiving. It's about giving. And that something that God wants all of us to understand, as I said, not just at Christmas season, but for the entire year. He wants us to understand how to give. We have to eliminate that selfish mentality because in teaching our children to just receive, we're raising them up to be dysfunctional 
as Christians. And they'll bring that selfish mentality into their adult lives and into their relationship with the Lord. And as adults, they'll struggle with their Christianity. And the conflict comes because now they learn that the heart of Christianity is selflessness, that the essence of our Christian walk is denial of self. See, a lot of people today are still in a struggle because even though they are saved, I still rules their lives. I, I, me, me, my, my. And as, pre- as I previously stated, the essence of Christianity first began with self-denial. Somebody say self-denial. I believe that the way we grew up had an influence upon our behavior. If there were a lot of kids at the dinner table, you had to think selfishly because either you were going to eat and eat well or you were going to get the scraps and the crumbs. And for some of you who grew up the only child, it would be easy to adapt to selfishness because the whole world centered around you. See, I believe with all my heart that many parents, when it comes to raising children, subconsciously make those sad mistakes of acting out years of being deprived. And now that you have a leg up, now that you are finally able to afford a little bit, because you've been deprived, now you want to try and overcompensate for the things that you lacked. So what we couldn't afford to receive, now we can afford to give our children. And our reason being, I want you to have what I didn't. But I have discovered that in doing that, we're not always doing our children a great service. Even though we try to protect our children from making the same mistakes that we made, there are some things they have to learn. There are some things they need to learn. I don't believe we ought to spoil our children past having problems and having to make decisions and having to deal with conflict. No, I don't believe that. Because I believe making decisions going through problems, and dealing with conflict is what made us who we are today. And I know that when you when you were young, you got upset because you walked in on Christmas morning and didn't have that fire engine or that dress or that train or that bike. But thanks be unto God, although you didn't have them, you grew up appreciating what you do have now. For those of you who grew up without you understand what I'm talking about. After a while, you were glad to get an orange or an apple or a banana. But some children, you know, now, if they don't have a car, if they don't have a hoverboard, if they don't have a PlayStation or a new bike and things, uh, and, you know, those things cost, what, hundreds of dollars? The first thing you hear them say, you mean I don't have a Christmas this year? No. No, Christmas is not about you. It's not about PlayStation. It's not about bikes. It's not about gold chains and platinum bands. We are raising our children to be dysfunctional in life because they will grow up and find out that God doesn't give them everything they want. And now they get mad with God because God takes them through wilderness and lack and they easily give up. I had never seen a generation give up so easy as the ones I see now. But those of us who have been through a lot, we don't give up that easy. The lack of new pumps won't keep us out of church. The lack of a new suit and a tie won't keep us from worshiping God. Why? Because we grew up without it. In other words, I don't have to have things in order to say that I'm blessed. What I call blessed is when I get up in the morning and I know where my help comes from. That's blessed. What I call blessed is when I don't let my circumstances nor my situation dictate my joy or my peace. Now, that's blessed. See, I can, can be blessed with lack because I've been without things for so long. 
And I would rather not have and get all of God. Not saying that not having is what it takes to it was what it's going to take. No. Because God wants his people to be blessed and to prosper. And I want to discard this new wave attitude that says everything about God is bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. No. That's not the situation. And there will be times when you won't have. There will be times when you will struggle. But that doesn't make God any less God, and it doesn't make me any less blessed. So stop getting discouraged as they turn off your lights. Shine the real light. Listen, I'm not saying that you won't have any struggles. But there are times when God will show you how to overcome in the midst of your struggle. I want to deal with this because I believe in the church. We spend our time fighting symptoms and not necessarily the sickness. I believe one of the causes for our problems in life is selfishness. We're too selfish. We think too much about self. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew 16, 24. Matthew's the 16th chapter and the 24th verse. Matthew 16, 24 says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Oh, praise God. This is the first thing you must do as a Christian. The essence of Christianity first begins with self-denial. We must die to self. The moment in a marriage when we begin to think selfishly, you will begin to become dissatisfied because self has a way of lifting his own standards and placing unusual and inhumane standards on other people. The first thing we do is expect others to do what we know we're incapable of doing. We expect others to bring us happiness and joy and bring us fulfillment when we can't even bring that to ourselves. Self must die. I come to let you know that your enemy is your inner me, is self. And let me say that again. Your greatest enemy is your inner me, is self, is you. I, me, me. My, my feelings are hurt. It, it, it wasn't happening for me. I don't see this. I don't understand. I'm not being satisfied. I'm not being pleased. I'm not being loved. How come they're not telling me what they need to tell me? You don't let me have this. You don't show me affection. You don't encourage me. You don't talk to me. I'm the one who's being slighted. They're looking at me funny. They didn't invite me. They didn't call me. How come I, 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 me, me, and what's happened? is you walk away a wounded Christian because of I, me, and my. It's time to let I die. I submit to you that if I died, then God would take care of I. The reason why marriages begin to go sour is because somebody starts talking about I. I'm not receiving love. I'm not understanding this. I don't feel like this is going to work. I, I, I. Why? Because that's how we grew up. I, I, I. We've been pampered, we've been babied, and we've been petted. And soon we'll bring all that stuff into our adult life. 
So today, I want to, and today the first thing we say is, I want to be pampered in the church. We want to be babied on our jobs. We want to be petted in our families, in our marriages. And consequently, we become dysfunctional at the, as adults. We can't take pain. We can't take being neglected. We can't take being overlooked because I has always been the center and the focus of our lives. But let me remind you that your walk with God is no more about I. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, says Jesus. Please turn with me to Romans 12, 1. Some of you know it by heart, but for the rest, Romans 12 and 1. Praise God. Romans 12 and 1, I hope you're there. Uh, As you're turning there, let me just say that I want you to understand why I is one of your worst enemies. It is because I brings about selfishness. And selfishness breeds individualism. The spirit of individualism is also the spirit of a consumer. The spiritual consumer is the person who wants to just look, take, and receive. Say that again, Pastor. Okay, I think I will. The spiritual consumer is the per- is the person who wants to just look, take, and receive. They don't want to give, they don't want to serve, they don't want to work, but just want to take. Give me, give me. Notice what Romans 12 and 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. And I want you to underline that. If you don't want to write in your Bible, underline it in your mind. Underline that. And be not conformed to this world. Worldly thinking is selfishness. Worldly thinking is individualism. Worldly thinking is self-centeredness. It's all about me, I, I, me. That's worldly thinking. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, traditionally, we've always used this scripture to mean personal individual salvation. But the principle of this scripture cannot be abstracted to mean personal individual salvation. Paul is dealing with One thought to the church in Rome. He's taking the principle of conversion, of not being conformed, but being transformed. And he's bringing those who are receiving the transformation into the body of Christ. This is important because I have heard this scripture used so many times inappropriately. He's talking about the body of Christ. He says in Romans 12 and 3, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Then he says, for as we have many members in one body, here he's dealing with the main topic, which is the body of Christ. It's not about individuals trying to submit their body. You, you know, we tell people, you got to submit your body, you know, to be a, perfect, a living sacrifice. We do that for individual salvation. But the purpose that God put that is for a group, the body, to bring people into the body. He's telling the church, listen carefully, he's telling the church that it's about being transformed, coming out of the world, coming out of selfishness, and bringing that changed mind into the body of Christ so that every last one of us can benefit and receive the greatest and the full fulfilledness of, of God. What, what do you mean? How do we receive that? We receive it corporately. 
God said, my whole thing is, if the individuals get right, then they would come and present themselves to the body so that the body would be right. The whole purpose is for the body to get right. And for the body to to get right, then he had to change the minds and the hearts of the individuals. So this scripture is not just dealing with individual salvation. It's dealing with the body of Christ. So how do we receive it? We receive it corporately. We receive the blessings of God, the transformation, the blessing of, of communion or unity corporately. When we get out of our selfish ways and when God transforms our minds and changes us, he not only changes us, but he brings us into his body. This is important. Then he leads us into a local assembly, that's a church, where we can learn the word of God and also learn how to coexist with other brothers and sisters. For those of you who believe that you don't have to go to church, let me put that to rest. Yes, you do. You need to go to church. God's plan is for you to go to church so that you can learn the word of God. And I know you say, well, I can learn the word of God by calling you pastor every Tuesday night. No, you, you learn some of it. But God wants you to learn the word of God. And he said, you will learn the word of God. You will learn it if you will only, 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 only follow his word. Just follow his word. I don't know if you can hear the beeping. I'm hearing a beeping in the background of my phone. I'm not sure if you hear it or not, but I pray that if you you do, just overlook it. Praise God. So here God wants us to come into his purpose, to come into his union, his body. He wants to be a body dweller. He don't want to be out there on an island. He wants to come to church so we can learn his word, and he wants to also learn how to coexist with other brothers and sisters. That is so important that we coexist with other brothers and sisters. Many of us go to church. We don't even speak to our other brothers and sisters. We go to church as soon as, the, as soon as they say amen. We run to our car. We don't take a moment to say hi. We don't take a moment to shake hands. We don't take a moment to find out what's going on with somebody else's night. We just take off. Take off. So I just want, I just want you to know that if we continue, uh, if we continue to follow the word of God, he would direct us where we need to go. He'll do that. So let's move, let's move forward. In the local assembly, uh, well, the church, I call it, the local assembly in the church, it coexists with other brothers and sisters. There, we learn how to serve. People always say, what's my job? How do I serve? What am I supposed to do? You learn to serve in your local church. That's where you learn to serve. Serve who? Serve God. That's where you learn. You, and I know you say, well, I can read books and learn how. No, it's, it's, it's different. It's different. God is always bringing us to a point of service. He changes us, and he brings us out of the world's mentality, which is selfishness, and puts us in position to be blessed. And how are we blessed? We are blessed when we serve. See, it's not about personal or individualism. It's about corporate. It's about the whole body, the whole body coming together because if we don't get out of the mindset of selfishness we will become discouraged and we'll find ourselves going back and forth from church to church from marriage to marriage from relationship to relationship no marriage will ever make you totally happy i need to repeat that again no marriage will ever make you totally happy No man will ever make you totally happy. No woman will ever make you totally happy. No church is perfect, and you will never have a perfect Christian walk. Did you hear me? You will never have a perfect Christian walk. I want to dismiss the myth and the preconceived notion uh, that once you get saved, life is perfect. Oh, how many people believe that? Once I get saved, everything's going to be all right. 
that once you meet a godly man and marry, that means your marriage will be perfect. Mm. And once you meet a godly woman and God allows you to find that good thing, let me tell you, that good thing will come with some flaws. She will come with some quirks and some nuances. People walk out of marriages because of selfishness. They never think about the children. They never think about the other person. They only think about themselves. And the first thing these talk show hosts, oh, my God, Maury Povich, Wendy Williams, Ellen DeGeneres, and all those folks, all they want to know is, well, what makes you happy? Tell us, how do you feel? Let's talk about you. Well, Maury, I was so upset, and because you know Ellen, and I have a problem because you know, you know, the, and that's our gospel, that what many people are feeding the prince and the power of the air. He's constantly sending those kinds of signals into our lives, and consequently, we begin to think selfishly, but the devil is a liar. And as my cousin Pat say, and the truth ain't in them. Christianity is the most selfless walk you will ever experience. You cannot be selfish and follow Christ. It just won't happen. You must understand the supernatural phenomena that took place when you got saved. You were literally brought in by the Holy Spirit, a supernatural transformation that took place. You are already dead in sin. And when he brought you in, he brought you into life. But before he brought you into life, you were buried with him. You identified with his death. You died with him. You were buried with him. Who died? Self died. The old man died. It's not you, the person. It's the man, the nature in you is what died. But if you are living your Christian life carnally, then you are constantly resuscitating that old man. How is anything that's supposed to be dead still active? Somebody tell me that. How is anything that's supposed to be dead still active? Quit giving your flesh mouth to mouth. Quit waking it up. It's dead. Quit resuscitating your flesh. It's supposed to be dead. And anything dead is supposed to be buried. God wants you to walk in a new life. What does this new life consist of? It consists of selflessness. Selflessness. The moment you were saved, and the Holy Spirit filled you. When you got up, you were raised in a new life. Second Corinthians five fifteen. Turn there, I'll give you a moment. Second Corinthians five and fifteen. Praise God. I'm so happy. I'm trying to uh keep from bubbling over. You know, ever since I started doing these uh internet conference call teachings that's true my tuesday night is on fire <laughs> my tuesday night is on fire all right uh i gave y'all that one for free second corinthians five fifteen says uh and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live without themselves but to him which died for them and rose again you know, I pray that this word tonight would change your life. He that died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Oh my God. I pray that once I'm once what I'm teaching will make you think twice about thinking about you. I'm gonna read I'm gonna keep interjecting this verse. And that he died for all, that they which live, Second Corinthians five fifteen, and he died for all, that they which live 
should not henceforth live unto themselves. It ain't about you, but unto him who died for him, who died for us, Christ, and rose again. Some of us are so fixated on us. We can't be any good for anyone else. God hates self. He hates self. I mean, think about it. If self was any good, if self was any good, don't you think God would have used it? I mean, really, think about it. If self had value, don't you think Jesus would have said in Matthew sixteen twenty four, if any man wants to come after me, bring yourself. But later on in the Bible, it says that in my flesh dwells no good things. I just want to encourage someone to come out of self tonight. Part of your struggle, major part of your struggle may simply be that you are locked into self. And God says, self must die. Let me close by saying this. If you want to follow him, then self, as I previously stated, must die. I thank all of you for listening to me. I I purpose to keep these uh, teachings under an hour because I know how our schedules are very busy. And again, uh, the recording for each lesson, the recording tonight, the recording tonight will be available uh, approximately 10 minutes after we go off the air. All you have to do is go to our church website at gttdetroit.org, gttdetroit.org. GTT stands for Gospel Truth Tabernacle. Gospel Truth Tabernacle, gttdetroit.org, and click on the media tab, the media tab. There you will find the call-in numbers and the access number for all the lessons that we have presented. And I just want to thank you all for sharing this time with me, for letting me come into your homes and your cars or even on your businesses and just taking a moment to give and listen to a word from God. Uh, also, if you ever in the Detroit area or if you are living in the Detroit area, our church doors as well as our hearts are always open to you. Feel free to come in and fellowship. I have a minister staff of four, what is it, uh, five other ministers who present the word. I don't always give the word. I, I do most of the teaching in the church. But my minister staff uh, presents a powerful message every Sunday. So feel free to come in and join us. I'm not going to put you in any pressure. I ain't going to make you talk. This is not to the members. Not any members listening to me. Y'all know I'm not talking to you. But to our visitors, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Just come on in. Come on in and fellowship with God and find the goodness in God's grace. If there's anyone who has not received Christ as their personal Savior and they wish to do so today, I'm going to ask you just to push the number five on your telephone keypad, the number five and then the star key, the number five and then the star key on your telephone keypad. It's going to indicate to me that your hand is being raised. If there's anyone who has not received the uh, uh, the salvation of Christ in their life, uh, push the number five and the star key. If there's anyone that has a prayer a need for prayer in their life, whether it's pain or you're going through something financial, wherever the case, I'm going to ask you to do the same. Push the number five and then the star star key on your uh, telephone keypad, and that will indicate to me that there's a request being made, and then we will pray. And I'm just thankful for all those. If there's anyone that has a testimony, anyone that has words they want to share or something they want to bring to the group, Again, push the number five and the uh, star key on your pad, and I'll open up the mic for you. I don't want to open up the mic for everyone. I'll open up the mic for you, and that way you can share with the group your your request or your testimony, and we'll go from there. And if not, I'm just going to have a general prayer, and then we're going to close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for the word that has gone forward. 
God, I thank you for all those who are coming to the uh, the class tonight, our lesson tonight. I pray a special blessing over their life. Help each and every one, God, that they will be able to receive that which they seek. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, touch the hearts of those that are heavy right now, those that are going through things unmentionable, those who have secret, secrets among you that they haven't even shared with their family or their churches or their pastors. God, but you know the secrets of every man's heart. We pray that you will minister to the need of each and every one. Again, as I stated earlier, bless our prayer list and all those who are gospel true family who are sick and afflicted. God, we pray a special blessing that you will walk into their home and turn their lives around. And not just turn around, God, but we encourage them to come back to church and get involved in the church, God. Get involved in the spirit of a unity that is being provided for them. Where there's unity, there's strength. And if I can get people to understand that, you can't be strong on your own. You need strength. A three core, a three uh, core, a three string core is not easily broken. And we have to keep that in mind. We need to, we need help one to another. We need to be peaceful one to another. So God, we pray now that you administer to the hearts and the minds of those in need. And God, again, we thank you for every blessing you have given us, everything you have directed for us, every avenue that you have opened up to to us. Thank you for my personal blessing you have given me and, and the teaching that you have given me and the leadership from my mother and father. God, I thank you for that. Thank you for those things that I heard and learned. And now as we close this prayer, we close it and we pray a special blessing over each one. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present your present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. In the name of Jesus, amen. Until next week, God bless you. Love ye one another.